Good morning, everybody, or good evening, as the case may be. Um, I'm Tom Peterson. I'm welcoming you to our 22nd global online seminar in biodiversity informatics. Um, this is also the third in a series on the history of biodiversity informatics. Um, and so you'll be able to check out previous chapters in this series uh, from Arthur Chapman and from Jorge Soberon, um, who committed, contributed the past two months to this series. So the final chapter in the, uh, the series on the history of biodiversity informatics, shall we say with a focus on sharing information, uh, sharing biodiversity data, is today's presentation with John Wachorek. Um, and you all know if you've been to these seminars before, I don't do much in the way of introduction, but I think in this case, no introduction is needed. Uh, John has been at the heart of um, essentially the, the entire, shall we say, second half of, uh, of the history of, of development of massive biodiversity information resources. Um, I got to start working with him I don't know what, 10 years ago, John, something like that. And it's Indeed. been a pleasure. Eight, whatever. Um, anyhow, uh -huh. it's been a pleasure. Uh, John has been absolutely central in the, the uh, modern phases of, of biodiversity informatics as a field. So I'm not going to do more than that as far as an introduction. Rather, I'll turn you right over to John. Um, and I'll mention just briefly that send your questions sooner rather than later so that we can get those questions answered uh, by John as part of this broadcast. Uh, so as questions come to your mind, please, please send them to the address that John will put up in just a moment. So John, many thanks for accepting to do this seminar and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. See if I can share. Are we good? We are good, yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Town. You're too kind as usual. <laughs> um, I'm John Vichorek. I My lair for the last 20 years or so has been the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at the University of California at Berkeley, or a tent in Argentina. I currently live in Argentina, and that's where I'm talking to you from today. Um, I want to thank Town for his efforts in the biodiversity information training series, the, the courses, and especially for these online seminar series. It's been uh, immensely helpful, I think, to our community and to our discipline to have this kind of sharing and training going on. Um, and I'm honored, of course, to have been invited to give this uh, third in a series on the history of biodiversity informatics. Um, Town had said that if you have questions or comments during the talk, accumulate those or, and or send them off to the email address that's on the screen now, biodivtraining at gmail.com. And given time at the end, town will be able to receive those and relay those, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions and answers. Town also mentioned that this is the third in the series, and I've had the good fortune throughout my career to be able to work with some of my heroes, and these are two of them. So I'm honored to be able to add to this series in a third part these distinguished names who I love and respect. Um, I came away with the two earlier talks by Arthur Chapman and Jorge Soberon thinking, wow, look how much people did, what amazing things were accomplished and how long ago. And so I sort of asked deeply, given that I'm meant to cover the recent era, what have we been doing lately? So the foray that I will make now is 
into more recent stuff, basically since I began in this field in 1997, more or less. And I have to say in advance that there's way too much activity. I can't cover everything, nor can I cover what I will in enough detail, but I have to try to give an overview of what we have accomplished. And I'll do so by trying to, to place it in the context of a grand hypothetical goal. And that would be to understand and monitor our living planet. And in that sense, we have a, new, a number of scales at which we would like to have understanding. Everything from the molecular to full Earth systems. So bear that in mind as we go through and try to understand what we've accomplished and what we have yet that are challenges. So in order to accomplish our goals, what we need is a lot of data, a whole lot of data. As we look at what we have today, we are impressed when we see numbers like 653 million uh, occurrence records in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility portal. But when you start to divide that up by location and time and taxon and whatever other filter of interest, the data become more and more sparse, and in some cases insufficient to answer our questions. For that reason, we need more data. I would also posit that the kinds of characteristics that we seek of those data are these that I have listed on the screen, that they be accessible, that they be discoverable, complete, pertinent, correct, managed, and linked. And I'll talk about these uh, as I go through. The important thing to note here is that there is a concept of fitness for use or fitness for a purpose. And I'd like to posit that the characteristics of interest there are that the data be complete, pertinent for the use you're trying to put them to, and that they be correct. And this will play out later when we talk about things like data quality. So here I give a summary of the what I'll try to cover the scope basically, and I'll divide it up into a couple of categories. The first category of things that I believe we've made great progress in so far. And you can see those listed here. And then after I get through some of those and examples and giving dates to when some things were accomplished, I'll start talking about some of the problems that we're in the middle of today. And it will be a challenge for a while, I think. So moving on, I'd like to go back then within our grand framework uh, and ask um, not how to monitor and understand the entire planet, because that was beyond our scope when we began, but rather how are we thinking about this when, at least when I began. And the scope is much, much reduced. Basically, we were thinking about species, different taxa, and the specimens or observations that gave evidence to where they could be found. So organisms and species on this spectrum. So we're talking about our origins now, origins of biodiversity informatics. The first thing to do is to put some of the activity of data standards, the more recent stuff, on a timeline. So. What you see here is basically the activity coming out of or associated with the Taxonomic Databases Working Group, which recently added to its name Biodiversity Information Standards so that outside of our close-knit community, people would understand what it was we were talking about. It also reflects something of the history that we have expanded beyond the original limited scope of taxonomy and into the broader realm. So Tadri began in 1985, and Arthur and Jorge talked a lot about the activities that went on associated with Tadri in the early days. Here I need to reiterate uh, at least one of those, and that is the adoption of the HISPID-3 protocol, or data standard, rather, uh, as a, a preliminary attempt to capture what I will call occurrence information. And I'll get to a little bit more about that in a moment. Within a couple of years, in the United States, we were experimenting with um, sharing data 
via a particular protocol, Z39.50. And that was the first time in which the Darwin core, parts of which we see in the standard today, were put into practice. That was in 1998. Soon thereafter, there was a, a meeting, sort of a what would now be a research coordination network type of meeting in 2001 at NCS in Santa Barbara, in which those active in the field of trying to publish and share data got together and talked about the two different um, project-based and philosophically aligned methods for data sharing. And those uh, did not receive any of the detail that I think they reserved in earlier talks. And I take this opportunity to point out at that meeting that the, the more or less European perspective of the ABCD schema the, and the BioCase protocol for sharing data via the ABCD came together with the folks in the United States and Australia, largely, to uh, share ideas about the depth and richness of data that should be shared. And so the two perspectives that were brought to the table there were that on the ABCD side, the full richness and relatedness of data were being modeled in the ABCD schema and were being shared via the BioCase protocol. On the other side, the Darwin core perspective was to be minimalist for several reasons. The basic ones were to try to reduce the obstacles to adoption, to make it easy to get data out there, basically to get people engaged as soon as possible. But it lacked the, the vast richness of ABCD. Along with Darwin Core at that time, the Darwin Core protocol was to connect data via the Darwin Core using a protocol that was created for the purpose called Digger. Now, uh, I'll continue now to talk a little bit about Digger and then later iteration of that called Tapir. Digger was a protocol to, to basically install install a server in your own institution and connect it to a local database and have above that a series of services that would call on those distributed data and make them accessible via a portal that contacted all of the distinct servers semi-simultaneously, accumulated their answers, and then presented them to the, the end user or to the portal that was calling it. The result was best typified by the diagram on the right now. Basically, it was a spaghetti of connections over the internet. And ultimately, the user sitting at the web browser on the top had to wait whether they were talking to a portal like the Mammal Network Information System or HerpNet, Ornus, FishNet, or any other digger network, had to wait for the slowest responder or until something time, until they timed out. And thus, the, the rigor of the system was, was compromised by all these tenuous connections. So that became clear as we began to add more and more different providers. It worked well when we had 17, 20, 25, but when we started getting 50 and more data providers and we had to wait for whoever was have, having problems, the portals that were connected to this began to not be serviceable. We outgrew our technology. We realized that in fact it was a bad idea. Commensurate with that, were developments in standards uh, in Darwin Core. It went from the simple, more or less 20 field definition of Darwin Core in 1998 to what is now the um, ratified standard via the Taxonomic Databases Working Group since 2009 with 169 different fields in it in various categories. If you look at the web page upon which this slide is based, the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide, you'll see 
that various terms or fields are divided up by categories, categories such as occurrence, organism, location, and taxon. These are to help people to understand uh, and, and to locate information about a particular subject within biodiversity. Now, one thing to understand about Darwin Core is that unlike previous attempts where the protocol and the fields that were to be shared were bound together with each other, here Darwin Core is meant simply to be a library of terms with what we hope are good enough definitions that when people use those terms, whether in a field in a database or in a portal, that they mean the same thing. They're all talking about the same thing. And to a greater or lesser extent, Darwin Core has achieved that. There are plenty of evidence to show that it's still not 100% successful. And again, that gets to data quality issues we we'll talk about later. So what am I, why am I talking about this now? It's because we had this problem uh, with the early Darwin Core and Digger protocol of having to connect to individual databases over the internet in real time when we made our queries. So along with the Darwin Core as a standard and definition of fields, a library of terms, a specification was created for how to share those types of data via text files. And that's known through promotion by GBIF as a Darwin Core archive. There are tools to um, produce and to use Darwin Core archives. On the screen now, I show a couple of those, one based in Java that was produced primarily by the folks at GBIF, and one in Python that was produced by Nicolas Noy in Belgium using Python. Both of these are tools that are open source and allow people to, given a Darwin Core archive, uh, look into it, grab information from it, analyze it, etc. On the publication side, the solution to replace all of those various distributed servers and digger uh, endpoints is the Integrated Publishing Toolkit. The <coughs> Integrated Publishing Toolkit came into existence in 2011 in a, pre in a preliminary iteration and was meant to allow people to publish these Darwin Core archives, these, this standard for sharing via text files. It's uh, a service endpoint again, but this time it's not a service endpoint that allows you to do a query. It's merely a service endpoint to allow you to find out metadata about a data set, usually about a collection, or to find the full data set itself and download it in text files. So what happens today are the aggregators, those who collect data and present it all together in combined interfaces, such as VertNet or GBIF, use Darwin Core archives and tend to capture those via published and registered integrated publishing toolkits. On the screen now, I'm showing you a, a capture of a screenshot for the VertNet portal. The point I wanted to make here is that unlike before where every collection basically needed to have its own server, a live functional and ready for queries, we now don't have to have that because we can share a single integrated publishing toolkit, such as the one for VertNet, among any number of collections. So VertNet, for example, hosts for 153 distinct collections right now. It doesn't mean that others can't have their own instances of IPT, and they do. But the nice thing is that no matter where it is, if it's registered, you can find it and you can get a Darwin Core archive and you can understand what you're getting and you don't have to be connected all the time. So, unlike what way you think 
with the way things used to be, with various portals such as Fishnet, Manus, Herpnet, and Ornus, we now have a single combined Vertnet portal in which all the data are combined and are aggregated at a single endpoint in a highly responsive system, in our case, for Vertnet based on Google App Engine, instead of waiting for internet connections to get your results back. And anybody who lived in the good old days will see the difference between those and appreciate the advances that have been made. Here is just a snapshot of the VertNet portal. I don't need to go into it too much, except to give an idea now about what aggregators are doing. So VertNet is an example of a, an aggregator where the scope is global, the geographic scope is global, but there's a taxonomic focus specifically on vertebrates. Unlike GBIF, which to me is sort of a gauge of the state of the art and the state of, of data publication throughout the world, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, is global in geographic scope and covers all taxa. You can see that the GBIF portal has been around since 2007, whereas VertNet has been around since 2011. There are other examples, but first I want to show the implications of that change of technology, as is expressed in this graph showing some of the earlier years of data publication to the GBIF network and aggregation there. So early on in the lifetime of GBIF, there was a bottleneck that was identified. It, it seemed that the growth of the system was steady and slow when it was also understood that there was plenty of enthusiasm and people out there who wanted to share data, and it just wasn't happening as fast as anyone had expected. This continued for far too long. When we were able to establish Darwin Core as a standard uh, and implement the tool, basically the integrated publishing toolkit, and get that out and available throughout the, the community, you could see an immediate and striking jump in the availability of data. This is an example of the tools meeting a demand and that growth has continued to today, where we do have 653 million occurrence records now available through GBIF. Moving on in other examples of data aggregators, what I want to point out here is that there has been a lot of reuse. So here I'm showing a snapshot of the dimensions of Amazonian Biodiversity Data Portal, which uses as its foundation exactly the same infrastructure as VertNet. In, in fact, it was possible to create this portal without all the, the customizations and fancy graphics specific to Amazonia within one day. The scope for a portal like this one is regional and all taxa. So we're, we're now trying to be more specific in what data portals do. These are what the following examples show. Another example is the map of life. And its uh, claim to fame is that it's very good at showing species distributions from various different kinds of sources, including primary data and different sources of species distribution maps. It covers all taxa, though not all taxa are equally covered currently. And it boasts a mobile app so that you can see what you might expect to find wherever you are, for example. Then, Using that same technology, uh, the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment has a portal. They, too, cover species distributions, but they're talking about specialized environments. Similarly, iDigBio has a portal. In their case, their uh, particular strengths, beyond what others do, are the, the whole process of the integrated digitized bio collections is digitization. There is a, it's a very large, massive digitization effort with 
the portal in front of it to show the results of those labors. The other thing that they're very good at is the capture and display of media. And in their case, the scope is specimen data. And have, they have recently expanded to be global. In all of these cases, you'll note the dates in which these things were uh, first established. <coughs> Uh, next, I'd like to point out one of the portals dear to my heart in that it came very early. It was early based on Digger Network, but then uh, also migrated to the new technologies of Darwin Car Archives and IPT. Ribioma is an instance of a portal with geographic focus, in this case, all Madagascar, all taxa. And what they do that's very interesting is to incorporate expert vetting. They have taxonomic review boards who look at the data coming in and bring the human experience, not just automated tools, to the um, flagging of data and data quality. <clears throat> no survey of portals would be complete without talking about the Atlas of Living Australia. A very impressive effort that has produced uh, a foundation for good science, as well as a foundation for replication at the national level. So the Atlas of Living Australia, its scope is national, and it covers all taxa. And the nice thing about it from the perspective of GBIF and and of trying to distribute the effort of mobilizing data and making it accessible in national context, ALA is a great basis for replication. And so an example of that in 2015 is GBIF France using ALA as the basis of another portal of national scope and all taxa. So by now, I've covered some of the basics of areas that we've made great progress in. We made it progress in standards, in, in data publishing, and in data aggregation. Now I need to move on to some of the stories about around that that people have asked about and that were important in the history. So digitization efforts are massive now. Then they cover everything from museum labels and registers of various kinds, such as herbarium sheets and insect pins, um, to those same things after digitized in images being assessed by citizen scientists in portals such as Take Notes from Nature and digitized to produce the data that we find in the portals and, and published through Darwin Core Archives now. Also in the long history <clears throat> was another aspect of either data digitization, if you want to view it that way, or in data augmentation in another. And that is the whole discipline of georeferencing. Here, what we're talking about is the production of analytical forms of spatial information from what were our legacy textual descriptions. So we're turning text into coordinates and uncertainties. And around this, there is a great deal of um, activity from early on, since 2001, with the pr first production of the, at that time, recommended practices would become published later as best practices uh, for capturing information and understanding its quality implicitly. All of that had its origins in that tent in Argentina. One of the interesting aspects around georeferencing was that in the early days, it was realized that the economy of scale could be achieved by creating collaborations between institutions. And the reason that that worked well is because each institution generally had its own geographic expertise and resources, such as maps, because 
it happens that collections tend to have research interests in limited numbers of areas of the globe and have the resources and even the primary first-hand knowledge of the collections that were done there. So what was done in these kinds of collaborations was to accumulate all of the locality information for a given country, say, and then have one institution with expertise there do the georeferencing for all the collections that participated. So the Manus and Ornus and Herpnet all uh, function this way. And the byproduct that wasn't actually intended at the beginning, but is obvious consequence, was that communities were created because all of those people were dealing with their colleagues and other institutions at all times to try to resolve issues. And it created those connections that persist today. And those communities remain strong. And one of the great things is that Geolocate has continued with that tradition by creating their online collaborative georeferencing platform. Next in the list of things that we have accomplished fairly well is that we have a wide array of data management systems for collections. Now, one might think, OK, a wide array is probably a bad thing. Why don't, we, why don't we standardize on something? And I believe that the answer is that these types of tools need to be very specific to the work that happens in the collections. They need to be apt for the day-to-day -day work. They don't need to be apt for the data sharing that comes afterwards. And in fact, all of them are perfectly suitable for that later step by doing exports and transformations from whatever the internal structures are into things like Darwin Core and Darwin Core archives. And that's true even down to the level of access databases in Fox Pro and even to Excel spreadsheets. So we find today that people are perfectly successfully publishing data from Excel spreadsheets. <clears throat> On top of all of the aggregation, there are a number of services that allow people to access data directly, to not have to go through a portal with a human user interface, but to get at data by other means, by programs and applic via application programming interfaces or APIs. On this page, I'm just showing a very small sampling and pointing out that there's a wide variety of such APIs that are written in the R language. And the links for those are here. There are others as well. <clears throat> there are also tools with APIs behind them, but also with user interfaces, graphical user interfaces, such as the iPlant Collaborative, or now known as Cyverse, Taxonomic Name Resolution Service, and similarly, the Global Names Resolver. So these are helping us to access information that is aggregated from numerous authorities, in the first case on plant names, and then in the second on all names, uh, to try to find current valid names and synonyms, and to resolve names that might be misspelled or incorrectly captured databases. So these help us to create applications to work on data quality issues. So now I've covered most of what I think we've done fairly well on and I need to move into the future and talk about things that are ongoing now, have been on our horizon for quite some time, but remain challenges. Arthur, early on, published these two papers that are available via GBIF on primary currents data quality and uh, the methods of cleaning those data. So this is from 2005, both of these. And a lot of the activity going on today is based on these. Uh, but we haven't fully solved our data quality issues. To try to do so, the taxonomic databases work group has created a special interest group on biodiversity data quality. And you can uh, see what activities are there and join in that. The idea here is to try to, to 
rectify the problem of individual silos of activity being conducted throughout the world on mostly the same issues of data quality. So we have innumerable different tools to do exactly the same thing. And it wasn't even really reasonable or feasible to find those tools because they were so, let's say, local. So part of the interest group's um, activities are to try to assemble and list those. Another is to try to come to some agreement about how data quality issues will be solved. And around that is a body of work being conducted by Alan Koch in Brazil on a framework for data quality to describe if data uh, quality assessments are made or if data improvements are made, that there's a framework around that that lets the, the uh, end user understand what was done by what means, for what purpose. One of the things that's happening today is that with all the enthusiasm about data quality, um, portals are beginning to provide feedback. And so you'll find feedback from GBIF, from IDBio, from VertNet on various aspects of the data that have been published and aggregated. <clears throat> the issue that's arising today and one that our community needs to solve sooner rather than later is that there are multiple feedback loops. Not only are data being reported by different mechanisms, for example, in GBIF, or sorry, in, in VertNet by GitHub, in GBIF by queries on the portal, in IDIGBio, again, by being able to filter on data quality flags. Sometimes the feedback that is given is contradictory, that one source will tell you that you should fix your country code to be AR, and another will uh, give you feedback to tell you that, no, it should be the three-letter equivalent unfortunately I don't know. So this creates a perception in the those receiving the feedback that there's not a great deal of consistency out there and who should they trust and should they even spend the effort if they're not even getting consistent uh, recommendations. And given that collections tend to have resource bottlenecks I suspect that this kind of non-unified front in data feedback is going to be more harmful than useful, that, it, that will be ignored. So uh, that's my call to the community to using the data quality interest group, get on top of this, get uh, unified in what our feedback is, and in also in the mechanisms in which that feedback is provided. A lot of work has been done on data quality and feedback in the filtered push project since 2010. And today, work continues. Now it's being uh, emphasized to create, let's say, very atomic or specific parts of data quality workflows. We call them actors. And the Curator Project is an example of such a such an endeavor at Harvard University and the University of Illinois. <clears throat> and the idea here is that along with the perception of a community of interest, people interested in data quality, that tools are created and let's say marketed, maybe not the right word, but promoted to be used and, and tested and compared against each other to try and actually solve this problem of conflicting views. And to, of course, create more availability for the types of information, types of tools that will improve data quality and augment it. I'll skip now onto a, a separate topic in which we are making great strides and that is data licensing. Early on in data biodiversity informatics, this problem was largely ignored. 
People put their data out there. They didn't understand the implications of data licensing. They didn't say much about it. But it's those who are, let's say, good citizens and data consumers actually need this information in order to use the data responsibly. In some cases, governments, for example, might be restricted from using data where the licenses are not explicitly stated. That means we're actually, by not saying anything, creating an obstacle to exactly the kinds of things that we're trying to promote. The use of data to understand and monitor our and save our living planet. So the strides that have been made are to try to understand the, the implications of various kinds of licensing to promote the most open licensing possible in order to break down those barriers and, and problems of data use. And then on top of that, to describe in separate documents, which have been come to know, be known as norms, in which Canadensis was a groundbreaker, a pioneer, and others have copied or expanded upon or rewritten to serve a particular community, norms that describe how to be a good citizen, how to use data, how to cite it, and why, why that's a good idea. So, Good strides have been made in this respect, and recently the Global Biodiversity Information Facility is trying to enforce that data licenses be chosen and that they be chosen from among those that actually allow the data to be used in a reasonable way. I'll new, <clears throat> now move on to getting out of our original views of biodiversity, uh, biodiversity informatics central um, centered on, let's say, the organism and species. So I'm going to do that in this diagram with Darwin Core uh, occupying the center. Darwin Core is our original view where we're interested in the context of organisms in place and time and the concepts that unify those, the taxonomic concepts that unify those. So the push since having success with data publication has been new data. New communities see that, okay, it's easy to publish, relatively easy to publish occurrence data, but you know what? I've got special data. I've got interesting data that aren't covered by that core, that Darwin core, and I want to be able to share those. Things like genetic resources for germplasm, for genomics information, for paleontology, and so on. So the push now is to find ways to use the successes that we've had in data publication and mobilization and expand that to include new stuff. So one way in which that is done is through extensions. And I'm talking here about specifically extensions to the Darwin Core by adding, for example, other files that contain media information. For example, the Audubon Core or Audubon Media Description Extension is a way in a Darwin Core archive to say what sounds or what videos or what images are associated with specimens and to add that information. This is the way in which ID Bio is able to have success in publishing so much media related to the specimen information that they aggregate is through an extension like this. Another example that's uh, being uh, promoted now is to add specifically the capability to talk about samples, material samples, and the sequence information that arises from those. So the example here is a, an extension that's in development for the minimum information about any sequence or mixes. So these are two examples of which there are many others about Darwin Core extensions. There are other ways that we are in the middle of trying to define best practices or community practices. And here I use Apple Core as an example. Apple Core is a community practice set of documents on 
how to populate the Darwin core. Remember I said the Darwin core is meant to be a library of terms. And if you look in the definitions of Darwin core, it tells you that there are, is a recommendation to use the ISO two letter country code for the country code field. But there is no uh, requirement to do so at the Darwin core level. And for other fields, such as preparations, in which you want to know what the material is that's in a collection, there is no recommendation whatsoever. So a community practice is a way to define on top of the Darwin Core standard what you should do for your discipline, Apple Core specifically about botany and herbarium data. I talked a little bit about DNA sequences when I talked about the Mixus extension for Darwin Core. There are portals that uh, that propagate this information and link to specimen information as well. And the bold system is a perfect example of that. So here we're, we're broadening again into more than the primary occurrence data. This primary occurrence is plus sequences now. Similarly, there are other communities who are just stepping in. They've been out there, they've been publishing data, they've even done so in semantically capable ways, such as open context for zooarchaeology and archaeobotany, but want to be able to leverage the kind of data publishing that we've been successful at using Darwin Core Archives. And so these disciplines are now joining, and we're learning from both sides how to link our data semantically, and as well to uh, mobilize and aggregate this extension of our understanding of our biosphere in deeper time using these kinds of data. So I use open context as a segue into one of our current ongoing challenges, and that is the foray into semantics in biodiversity. The diagram I have here is meant to show the vast array of different types of data that have been semantically enabled, at least at the level of linked open data. Every bubble here is some kind of a data set, and all the web behind it are the interconnections that can be found between them. The point behind semantics is to be able to make linkages between basically any two bubbles in this diagram, any two disciplines, with questions that cover the two of them whether or not we know anything about the links in between. So that's the great promise of semantics, is to be able to broaden the questions that we're able to ask outside of the domains that we personally are familiar with. So in 2015, um, one of the long-standing omissions of the original Darwin Core standard in 2015 was to identify and, and create documents for how to share data in Darwin Core via the Resource Description Framework, or RDF. Similarly, more recently, um, we have sort of gone back to something of our original roots in trying to describe our understanding of biological collections and the relations between them and the rest of biodiversity informatics via ontologies. So why do I say we're going back in time here? You remember I talked about the ABCD? The ABCD is rich in terms of its description of the relationship between units in a collection, things like specimens, and the collections themselves, and the taxa, and the determination process of what taxon to apply, to one of those specimens and the histories thereof. In other words, it was, though not couched in an ontological language, an attempt to structure the world and provide the semantic meaning that ontologies do for us today. Similarly, another foray into that realm was the Taxonomic Databases Working Group Ontology, the Tadric Ontology. 
in which similar work was done to try to describe our domain and the relationships between different kinds of concepts in a very formal way. Unfortunately, that work was not completed. So the biological collections ontology is a way to go forward, keeping in mind those original goals and to bring us into the, the modern realm where we can connect uh, our biological diversity information with the broader realm, such as environment. And here I'm showing uh, some screen captures and information about the environment ontology. We're trying now to get into the bigger context, let's say. One of the problems that we have, the biggest one I would say, in our forays into linked open data and into ontologies is our lack of uptake and the obstacles to doing so of global unique identifiers. There is a great deal to, be, to say about global unique identifiers, but I need to be brief and just say that we haven't solved this problem. We have innumerable ways to try to uniquely identify our, our concepts, our specimens, our images, and so on, with varying levels of success and varying levels of usability. This is a major problem. Global unique identifiers are the, let's say, single strings or URLs that define an object, specimen, etc., so that it cannot be confused with any other anywhere else in the world. Why is that important? It's important because we need these identifiers for the technology that semantics are built upon. Finally, we find ourselves in challenging times because we are now accumulating data in bigger quantities than we're able to deal with. eBird, for example, in their latest public uh, uh, snapshot has over 212 million records. And that's growing by 40 million records a year, more or less, or maybe even growing faster year by year. So we're in a situation where Basically, a third of GBIF is just as one data set. And that produces challenges. To move that kind of data around is not something you can do. You can't download it this afternoon and put it in your access database or in your GIS and just play with it. We have other issues that we have to try to overcome here. We need to, in fact, start bringing our analyses, our programs to the data, rather than thinking about bringing the data to put into our programs. It's a change of, of scope, a change of perspective. Finally, a huge problem we have is the problem of sustainability. In our discipline, we have a history of doing things in projects. They live for the life of the project, and then they may persist for a time after that. They may go away. They may persist by morphing into something new, where we're adding a new capability. But again, it's a, a limited lifetime. And that is a, a problem for the kinds of services that need to persist over time, the things that are ultimately useful basically forever. So I propose that one of the ways to try to solve that problem is something called service containers, where the software and the data needed to run the service is basically something you can download and put on a machine yourself, the whole entire server. You don't have to mess around with downloading software that's out of date and figuring out what doesn't work because something changed. Basically, you just download something that did work, put it somewhere, and start using it. That's one way to achieve a part of the sustainability problem. Uh, to, to accomplish or, or rectify part of the sustainability problem. Uh, many of the issues associated with the sustainability and the vision of the future can be found in these two, uh, these two papers in BMC Ecology with alternate perspectives on the same problem. They are a good read. I highly recommend that you look at these. And then finally, I want to make a plea that for our discipline to remain dynamic, that we can't forget that there is a human 
expertise aspect that should not be neglected. If you look at the history of things that have worked well, it's because there were people there to make it work well. And there are two different parts of this that I think go into making uh, aspects of our discipline sustainable. That is the development and continued development of tools. Open source software helps to do that. And along with that, training. Having people you can go to that will help you out in the problem that you face if it's something that has been faced before. And it's for that reason that I am immensely grateful to town for his huge efforts in making all of this kind of information in our discipline available through the BITC and through this online series. So that's all I needed to say. I haven't left hardly any time, but if there are questions, then I'm welcome and open to have them now. Here's the email address. Thanks, John. If I could organize applause from around the world, I would, but that seems to be beyond the current level of technology. Um, thanks so much for this perspective. Um, everybody, I would uh, strongly suggest that you send John some questions. Um, I'll tie him up for a couple minutes with one question. And so if your questions come in in that time period, great. Um, John, you talked a bit about um, filling taxonomic gaps, or at least the different taxonomic foci of the different initiatives. Mm -hmm. I've, I've come to focus quite a bit on the gaps in space and time in this data set. Obviously, there are, there are gaps that will always be gaps. I mean, we don't have much in the way of biodiversity data from before 1700. Um, <clears throat> but what could you reflect about how to fill uh, taxonomic gaps, sorry, temporal gaps and spatial gaps in the record for any given taxon? There are obviously limits about what we can do. But the first is to try and actually discover what the gaps are. And for that, we need the huge aggregations. And we need the analysis on top of it, of which you're fully aware. If you want to know how to fix the problem, you need to know what the problem is. How can we fix a temporal gap? We need to locate data to fill it. That's not an easy thing, because we're bootstrapping here. We can say, yes, here's the gap unless you have some knowledge of who might have that information and chase it down and promote the digitization and inclusion of it, you're kind of stuck. One way around it might be uh, a method uh, or initiative to show gaps, to have portals that show exactly what we don't know rather than what we do, and to have people try to fill it, you know, make a game out of it. It's like, do you know something about this place and time? Let us know. Get a prize. I'm being a little facetious, but I don't under, I don't really honestly know how else we can fill it. Well, I agree with you completely. Um, I love the idea of um, featuring the gaps rather than featuring the density. Um, I think that's the that's the key to. Um, mobilizing data that do exist. Then, of course, the question is, uh, what do you do to mobilize data that that um, are, in some sense, dark? But that may be a long-term challenge. Um, I don't see Some questions. of it might be going to the literature, I don't know. Say, sorry, say again? Some of it might be possible by going to the literature. Literature, without a doubt. Some of it might also be possible by improving data quality so that the all that variation is reduced. Uh, and, and certainly um, bringing data into currency via georeferencing. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. a digital data record exists if it's not georeferenced, but it tends not to get used. And if you look at georeferencing rates as a 
function of time of origin of the record, uh, it's obviously massively biased because of all of the new observational data. But essentially, all the new observational data are perforce georeferenced, whereas a pretty big proportion of the historical specimen data, as you know painfully well, are um, just endowed with a, a locality descriptor. And so, you know, certainly mobilizing those data strategically is is a step forward. Um, One of my local listeners also had a great idea <laughs> and put forth that another way to augment this is through annotations, you know, by making all these data visible to the public. And we've seen this coming through in feedback to VertNet. It's actually a huge community who are looking at data and saying, ah, oh, you know what? That collector was in such and such a place, and the field notes can be found here and get all the associated information that never made it into the, the currently available record. So I think that is indeed a great idea. And, and the specimens are located at such and such an institution that is not yet sharing its data. Right. And um, there's more on the label than meets the eye and things right, like that. Right. right. Uh, and I would just mentioned that the journal Biodiversity Informatics um, has now a series of national biodiversity diagnoses, which are, you know, plants of Cote d'Ivoire or, or, you know, birds of wherever. And the idea is to point out the gaps. So we've got, I think, three papers published and two in the hopper that are along those lines. And people are very welcome to contribute to those if they're interested. Yeah, more data. <laughs> Can we quote you? Yes. Okay. Well, we're not getting questions coming in other than from me. Um, so I will take the opportunity to give you a very big thank you. And oh. um, very much appreciate your putting the time into, into preparing this, this talk, John. Sure. Thanks for inviting me, Tom. Okay. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. And coming up late April will be uh, at least uh, the plan is a talk on the history of niche modeling and distribution modeling approaches. Um, I won't tell you who will be giving the talk because it's me. Um, because if you knew that it was me, you probably wouldn't tune in. Anyhow, uh, thanks again, John, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. Take it easy. <laughs>